Like many of you, no doubt, when I first started reading A Thousand Plateaus, I followed the author's suggestion. I read here and there, I read a plateau and then another plateau. Um, and then I accepted the crazy challenge to uh, present an overview of Mille Plateau in 200 words or less. And so recently I've been doing surveys or survol of uh, Mille Plateau at 1,000 plateaus an hour, at 2,000 plateaus an hour, at 3,000 plateaus an hour. Um, but today I'm going to do something different, which is to argue for the importance of this book. And to do so, I will examine the role uh, that the image of thought plays within it. Indeed, given time, I would want to argue that the addition of the image of thought in, uh, to A Thousand Plateaus is one of the important differences between the two volumes of Capitalism and Schizophrenia. And I would point out in support of this claim the careful review of the concept of the image of thought that Deleuze and Guattari provide in their last collaboration, What is Philosophy? But my narrower focus today is A Thousand Plateaus, and in what follows, I want to explain its importance both in the short term and in the long term. But first, a few words about the image of thought itself. The image of thought in forming A Thousand Plateaus is, of course, the rhizome, title of the introductory plateau. There, the rhizome is contrasted with two arborescent images of thought, tap roots and radical roots. But these two enemies of multiplicity overlap later in the book with two forms of social authority, the frontal face and the averted face of the despot god. And they overlap with two kinds of scientific epistemology, the deterministic and the probabilistic. The relationship between the rhizome and these other two images of thought is especially significant for the long-term importance of A Thousand Plateaus, as we will see. The image of the rhizome itself, meanwhile, is derived primarily from Proust and Kafka. And I take it as no accident that in between the two volumes of Capitalism and Schizophrenia, Deleuze publishes the third and definitive edition of his Proust and Signs, and that Deleuze and Guattari together published their study of Kafka. From the very first page of this study, Deleuze and Guattari characterized Kafka's work as a rhizome, just as A Thousand Plateaus will be characterized as a rhizome from its very first plateau. In the world Kafka depicts, every room is connected to innumerable other rooms by means of doors and passageways, many of which are hidden or subterranean. Any room, it seems, can connect with any other, depending on circumstances. Particularly in Kafka's longer novels, the arrangement of space is like a cross between a bureaucratic organizational chart, showing lines of power and desire within them, and a blueprint or roadmap showing the actual position of buildings and rooms. More like an organizational chart, however, the connecting lines can change at any time for unknown reasons as relations of power and desire themselves change. Likewise, a thousand plateaus can be characterized as a rhizome with innumerable subterranean passageways connecting various concepts and examples beneath the unavoidably linear arrangements of words forming sentences sentences forming paragraphs, and so forth. Such is the passageway connecting mapping and nomad science that I suggested after Eric Ishard's talk. If Kafka's rhizome takes the form of a spatial multiplicity, Proust's rhizome is more of a temporal one. Throughout his signature novel, In Search of Lost Time, Proust emphasizes the importance of involuntary memory, Image of the, images of the past that occur to us involuntarily are far more important than memories that are recollected at will. A certain sensation in the present will suddenly evoke a memory from the past without there being any direct or immediately obvious connection between the two and without involving any conscious intention whatsoever. These memories are far richer and reveal more about the past than voluntary memory can. Yet they defy conscious mastery, 
This makes the project of, of retrieving lost time a difficult, if not impossible, one. As the novel unfolds, a vast network of connections between times present and times past emerges, over which the narrator tries to exert some measure of control, or from which, at least, he will try to distill some kind of meaning. But the longer Deleuze works with Batari, the less he sides with the narrator and the project of retrieving lost time, and the more he highlights the writing machine that produces the network of involuntary temporal connections to begin with. Whereas Kant had insisted on adding the subjective eye to experience as a regulative idea to provide a stable, coherent ground for true knowledge and ethical action, Proust leads Deleuze in the opposite direction by subtracting the subject from experience and by treating the subject as a byproduct or residue of experience itself. From this perspective, what is paramount in Proust's work is the patchwork of temporal relations woven by the narrative machine, which produces the impression of a life, and the question of whether the narrator can ever take complete control of that life becomes secondary. Such a life forms a rhizome that can be characterized as an open temporal multiplicity. That is to say, it consists precisely and only of the connections composing the patchwork. Its possible or projected unification at the command of or as a property of the narrator or author then appears as a supplementary dimension added to the patchwork life but not necessary for it to maintain its consistency as a life. In any case, it is the special parapersonal consistency of the Proustian literary machine that the and Guattari will, ad will adapt for a thousand plateaus. The book will consist of a patchwork rhizome of relations among concepts and plateaus, intentionally not unified by a single line of argument a single authorial voice, or a single disciplinary perspective. And this leads us directly into the first reason for the immediate impact and short-term importance of A Thousand Plateaus. It was an astounding and outstanding example of what came to be known as theory, the practice, which had already started with structuralism, of drawing on a range of disparate fields, linguistics, anthropology, philosophy, economics, and so on, in order to produce novel research paradigms or strategies that didn't belong to any one of them, strategies that then were fed back into research projects in all these disciplines and more. A Thousand Plateaus simultaneously exemplified, encouraged, and enabled this kind of theoretical practice and theory-informed research. First, perhaps in the humanities, especially literary and cultural studies, then the arts, especially architecture and music, and eventually the social science, especially geography and political theory. Indeed, the rhizomatics practiced by Deleuze and Guattari in A Thousand Plateaus had a special affinity with cultural studies, a second reason for the force and immediacy of its impact in the English-speaking world, at any rate, where cultural studies was in the ascendancy when the book first appeared. Cultural studies had developed principally out of intense dissatisfaction with the disciplinary limitations of, liter of lim literary studies, history, and anthropology, and became interdisciplinary, if not antidisciplinary, as a result. More importantly, the animus inspiring cultural studies was directed lar largely against the discipline's inability to address pressing social problems such as unbridled militarism, rampant poverty in the midst of vast wealth, environmental catastrophe, unresponsive representative democracy, and so on. Oriented to problems and problematics rather than discipl discipline-bound axiomatics, cultural studies would draw tools from whichever disciplines could be found useful in order to address problems that did not arise within, and indeed were often excluded from, the purview of any one of them. And it would produce local knowledge of immediate use in addressing such problems 
rather than contribute to the edifices of purportedly universal disciplinary knowledge. Its aims and procedures were therefore very similar to those Deleuze and Guattari described in A Thousand Plateaus as nomad or minor science. And at the limit, a limit that Paul Feyerabend has termed epistemological anarchism, nomad science would proceed, unlike royal or state science, with no image of thought whatsoever. As Deleuze and Guattari say in the Nomadology Plateau, nomad science involves not another image in opposition to the image of thought inspired by the state apparatus. It is rather a force that destroys both the image and its copies, the model and its reproductions. State science, by contrast, does operate according to images of thought, and it is these state images of thought that I want to map out in order to assess the long-term importance of A Thousand Plateaus. In order to move quickly here, I will take it for granted that the botanical, the botanical trio of images of rhizome, taproot, and radical root that appear in the introductory plateau correlate with the socio-historical trio of images of the full frontal face, the averted face, and the probe head that appear later in the book. And furthermore, that both of these sets of images map onto three distinct scientific images of thought, which can be characterized in terms of classical dynamics, linear thermodynamics, and nonlinear complexity, or dynamic systems theory. Each of these images of thought has a corresponding primary object or dominant scientific field. Solid state physics and the problem of trajectories for classical dynamics. Chemistry and the problem of heat transfer for linear thermodynamics. Biology and the problem of life for nonlinear dynamic systems theory. And they each have a corresponding explanatory principle as well. Mechanical determinacy for classical dynamics, statistical probability for thermodynamics, and contingent emergence or self-organization for dynamic systems theory. We are most interested here in the third of these scientific images of thought in relation to the first, despite the fact that the second of third of these second and third of these epistemologies share one significant feature the irreversibility of time, which is, does not pertain in classical dynamics. In classical dynamics, trajectories run exactly the same forwards and backwards. In thermodynamics, as per its famous second law, the law of entropy, time runs only forward as order decays into disorder in any closed system. In dynamic systems, too, time runs only forward, but here order can emerge from disorder in open systems with net inputs of energy. Deleuze and Guattari's most general term for immersion order of this kind is consistency. Other scholars prefer self-organization. And we will in a moment be considering two specific forms of consistency, which Deleuze and Guattari call trans-consistency and intra-consistency. But the reason I'm interested in comparing this third scientific image of thought with the first one is that while Kant is widely considered to have provided the metaphysics corresponding to the scientific paradigm of his day, I want to suggest that the long-term importance of Deleuze and Guattari's collaborative work is to have provided the metaphysics corresponding to the emergent scientific paradigm of our day, nonlinear complexity. One must make, make metaphysics into the correlate for modern science, Deleuze once said, exactly as modern science is the correlate of a potential metaphysics. What's more, I want to suggest that the metaphysics Deleuze and Guattari provide us with, in fact, represents the completion of the very critical project that Kant initiated but was unable to complete himself. I'll only be able to gesture at that uh, today, but that's the, that's the overall framework in which I understand the importance of, uh, of Deleuze and Guattari's collaborative work to reside. I will limit myself here to two points of comparison with Kant, 
beyond what I've already said about Proust and the subtraction of the self from the experience of a life. First of all, where Kant sought to determine the a priori conditions of all possible experience in order to provide imminent criteria for the critique of knowledge, Deleuze and Guattari proceed to determine the real genesis of actual experience in order to provide imminent criteria for the critique of human forms of life. Where Kant sought to determine the a priori conditions of all possible experience in order to provide imminent criteria for the critique of knowledge, Deleuze and Guattari seek to determine the real genesis of actual experience in order to provide imminent criteria for the critique of human forms of life. This focus on the critique of actual forms of life is what makes schizoanalysis a revolutionary materialist psychiatry in volume one, and what makes rhizomatics anti-capitalist. And it's one way they complete the Kantian critical project. Second point of comparison, whereas Kant had to add regulative ideas, the ideas of self, world, and God, to secure his account of the conditions of possible experience, Deleuze and Guattari reject all three of these ideas, starting with the self. As we learn from Proust and Nietzsche, experience is not only possible without a sovereign self, most experience, in fact, bypasses the self altogether. The locus of actual experience for Deleuze and Guattari is not the self, and here we see considerable overlap with Foucault's work, but rather institutions, machinic assemblages of bodies correlated with collective assemblages of enunciation. And so, determining the real genesis of actual experience entails understanding the genesis of institutions, among the most important of which is capitalism, whose emergence Deleuze and Guattari ex examine in some detail in both volumes of Capitalism and Schizophrenia. True to complexity theory, they consider capitalism's emergence to have been entirely contingent. And yet, once it attained a sufficient degree of consistency, it became a self-replicating abstract machine operating by axiomatization. Their analysis of the emergence of capitalism is distinctive on at least three counts. First of all, Contrary to versions of Marxism that take the mode of production as determinant, the and Guattari insist that the state was required to make production into a mode in the first place. Only under the domination of the state does production get separated out from the warp and woof of social life and become susceptible to organization as a mode. Second, the process that Marx, quoting Adam Smith with considerable irony, referred to as so-called primitive accumulation, does not entail someone gradually saving up, uh, saving up enough money to hire other people to work for him, but rather the transfer of an infinite debt relation from the despot to capital. The despotic state and its mode of production were thus a crucial precondition for the emergence of the capitalist mode of production, an account that explains the primacy of finance capital over industrial capital, and of debt relations over exchange relations, arguably better than classical Marxism can. Three, following Fernand Baudel, Deleuze and Guattari assert that extended commercial exchange relations self-organize in two forms, which they call trans-consistency and intra-consistency. Trans-consistency links towns and markets via trade routes into horizontal networks. It brings about what Deleuze and Guattari call a complete but local town-by-town -town integration, in much the same way that birds flock or fish school. <coughs> Typically, trans-consistency supports a plurality of currencies. Intra-consistency, by contrast, brings exchange relations under the dominion of a single power center and a single currency, forming a vertical hierarchized aggregate and bringing about a global rather than local integration based on the stratification of territory. The distinction between these two forms of consistency is significant because Deleuze and Guattari insist 
here again agreeing with Brodel, that capitalism triumphed through the intricacy of the hierarchical state form and not through the transconsistency of the town form. For, for capitalism to self-organize and become self-sustaining in the first place on this analysis, it needed not just a critical mass of liquid wealth transferred from the, de from the despot through public finance and sovereign debt, and not just a critical mass of labor power forced by law into dependence on the job market by measures such as the British Enclosure Acts, but it also required a unified national market protected from competing commercial enterprise, a uniform currency, a stable national credit system, and so on, all of which were furnished by the state in its stratification of territory. Their genetic account of the institution of capitalism does not stop there, however. For the capitalist machine is not just self-sustaining, it is self-replicating and self-expanding. And so it eventually reaches a tipping point, which Deleuze and Guattari locate in the middle of the last century, with the evolution of total war into the Cold War, a tipping point where the dominance relation between state and capital reverses. The container becomes the contained. The state which had been necessary for the emergence of capitalism becomes subordinate to capital. Due to the relation between war and the production, destruction, and further production of weaponry, not only was war no longer politics by another means, as von Clausewitz had put it, but politics and war, whether hot or cold war, had both, in effect, become capital accumulation by other means, had become mere means for the accumulation of capital, and particularly for averting capitalism's endemic crises of overproduction. Henceforth, states merely serve as what the and Guattari call modes of realization, or models of realization, rather, for the singular capitalist axiomatic operating worldwide. What this reversal reveals, in turn, is a tendency for the intraconsistency that was crucial for capitalism's emergence to give way to a new form of transconsistency, but now on a much larger scale, on a global scale, with states in all their diversity assuming the position once occupied on a smaller scale by towns, and without the resonating power center characteristic of intraconsistency and the state form of domination. This shift to a new, global form, a new form of global transconsistency is the feature of Deleuze and Guattari's genetic account of capitalism from which Hart and Negri derive much of their analysis of what they call empire, concerning which two caveats need to be raised. The first applies perhaps almost as much to Deleuze and Guattari as to Hart and Negri and calls into question whether global capitalism really does still lack a power center. For while it is true that the kind of territorial stratification that states perform has not been reproduced on a worldwide scale, nevertheless, bodies like the World Trade Organization, founded 15 years after A Thousand Plateaus, but six years before Hart and Negri wrote Empire, this kind of institution has indeed attempted to subordinate the space of international trade to universal structures and strictures. And they have largely succeeded in restoring something of an in intraconsistent power center to global capitalism, or so it seems to me. Be that as, as it may, the second caveat is both more certain and far more important. Hart and Negri's account, unlike Deleuze and Guattari's, is patently teleological. Their linear view of history guarantees the passage through empire to the worldwide empowerment of the multitude. The Liz and Guattari's nonlinear view of history, by contrast, provides no such guarantees. An empowered global multitude may represent one basin of attraction afforded by the tendency of global capitalism to replace interconsistency with transconsistency. But there is no saying how or whether a tipping point will be reached that would propel us permanently into that basin or not. This is one reason Deleuze and Guattari declare at the end of Antiochus that schizoanalysis has no political program. 
And why a thousand plateaus is, if anything, even more cautious than that. And yet they insist at the same time that capitalism and schizophrenia is nothing if not political philosophy. And it is a political philosophy with clearly revolutionary pretensions, as noted above. To understand how this can be so, we return to the issue of Kant's critical project and to the sense in which Deleuze and Guattari can be said to transform and complete it. The key transformation, as we saw, was the replacement of Kant's account of the a priori psychological conditions of all possible experience with accounts of the real historical genesis of actual institutions, institutions such as capitalism. The choice of institutions as the privileged object of analysis is significant. Unlike law, which acts negatively to limit and curtail human behavior, institutions for Deleuze, following Hume, are creative, self-organizing responses to the problems of human needs, instincts, and desires. And here, I'm, I'd like to continue a conversation that started by Emma Ingala in one of the panels about the relationship between needs and desires in capitalism and schizophrenia. There are, are institutions, capitalism among them, but not only capitalism, many schools are organized uh, to produce the same effect or produce the same effect. There are institutions that mediate or deprive us of what we have produced, separate us from what we can do and what we have done. And there are institutions um, such as the institutions that Cantarina and, uh, and behind her, uh, Ian Buchanan, have organized, um, that accelerate what we produce and enjoy together. So the key thing is to um, develop institutions where needs are not created by separating out desire from what it produces. So just as organs and species are the self-organizing experimental probe heads by which life responds, without guarantee of success to the problem of how to survive and thrive. Institutions are the self-organizing experimental probe heads by which the human species responds to the problem of how to survive and thrive, also with no guarantee of success. And just as the contingent consolidation of organs and species in the process of evolution prompts further experimentation with life forms, the historical consolidation of always contingent institutions both partially satisfies human desires and prompts the development of new ones. Given a situation where, as I have suggested, the institution of global capitalism exhibits dual or bifurcating tendencies toward both transconsistency and interconsistency, the ethical and political challenge is to experimentally counteractualize or destratify existing institutions in the hope of prompting change for the better, for more complete satisfaction and further development of human desires and capacities. If you believe in the prospects of interconsistency, so to speak, you might seek the expansion of human rights through the International Court of Justice. If you believe in the prospects of transconsistency, you could seek to expand the global commercial network of fair trade. And unless they could be shown to interfere with one another in some definitive way, there would be no reason not to pursue both of these bases of attraction. But the point of complexity theory is that there is no guarantee of success or failure for either path. We can't know in advance but we experiment anyway. We can't go on with complete confidence, and yet we must go on, to paraphrase Beckett, and it turns out Foucault and Merleau-Ponty and others. We can't go on, we must go on. Not that experimenting without guarantees means acting blindly. The main reason to provide genetic accounts of institutional strata in the first place is to map their virtual lines of flight or destratification and to identify potential alternative basins of attraction. And yet, genetic accounts don't stipulate a particular course of action either, or even necessarily entail a preference for one form of consistency over the other. About the choice between transconsistency 
and interconsistency, precisely, Deleuze and Guattari ask in A Thousand Plateaus, who can say where the greater civil violence resides? And as if that question wasn't pointed enough, they end A Thousand Plateaus very much in the same vein with the admonition, never believe that a smooth space will suffice to save us. Political philosophy, in other words, maps the virtual so as to present cred credible choices to us, not to make them for us. But there is another equally important sense in which experimenting without guarantees does not mean acting blindly, which leads us to Deleuze and Guattari's version of the position in ethical theory called consequentialism, and to their counterpart to Kant's a priori moral imperatives. For experiments yield results. That's the point of doing experiments. The whole point of experimenting is to be in a position to evaluate the results. And for Deleuze and Patari, institutional experiments are ultimately to be evaluated according to one basic criterion, the extent to which they enlarge our prospects for freedom of action and enjoyment. And so in the end, the lasting importance of the thought experiment that is A Thousand Plateaus depends on the contributions it prompts us to make to those prospects. Thank you.